Facebook friends, thank you for joining us for our second oops, Lunch with the Lab. Um, my guest today is Joe. He is from UCSF. He is a scientist there. And so we are going to cook together. We're going to uh, cook a chicken recipe that is super simple to make. It's pretty unscrew upable and so good for a Monday night. Perfect. And this will take us about probably 10 minutes. And then we're going to sit down and while our lunch cooks, um, I'm going to throw out some questions to Joe about the research that he's doing at the lab, at his lab in UCSF. So let's get started. First of all, cheers. Welcome to thanks my kitchen. Me. Yeah, yeah it's great thanks to be for here. coming. Uh, what's your cooking experience like? Minimal, on the low end. Great. Okay, so this yeah. is a good recipe for us to do. So um, this is a baked chicken recipe. It's pretty much one dish. You throw all the ingredients into one pot, and then you bake it for about an hour. Uh, I learned how to do this from my godmother. We used to spend a lot of time up at a lake uh, off of Tahoe. Have you been up there? I have, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, so we would, we would bake this up there. And the original recipe called for canned mushrooms and, you know, like can't, basically canned vegetables, but we are not going to do that here. So first thing I want you to do, I'm going to put you to work, Great. is um, slice up an onion. Okay. Um, so here we go. I'm just, yeah, so these are pretty sharp. Okay. Um, so we just need one onion. You don't have to slice it too thinly. Okay. So where did you grow up? I grew up in London, Ontario, which is a couple hours away from Toronto. Pretty chilly up there, huh? It is. Certainly this time of year it is. Probably in February, I think San Francisco is a good place to be. Beautiful down here. I mean, it's sort of nice and consistent all year round, where Toronto is a little, uh, little more wild. You went to school in Toronto? Yeah, I went to the University of Waterloo first for college, and then uh, University of Toronto for my PhD. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so in this recipe, you're slicing that up. We're going to use uh, one cup of rice. And this recipe is both up on livingmactavish.com as well as on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash livingmactavish. Um, so I am going to put a knob of butter into the bottom of this oven-friendly dish. Smaller. Good. Oh, you know what? These are old onions. We can take out the sprouts. Perfect. Yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> onions can last around in a house for a long time. Yeah, take those out. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, 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 that's fine. You can even do them bigger than that. Uh, okay. So one cup of rice. There you go. One cup in there. And then we're going to put the onions on top. What did you study when you were up at the University of Toronto? Toronto was uh, officially molecular genetics was the title of my PhD, but it really I, I study microbes, bacteria, and how they live and what they do. That's really what, what drives my interest. Did you always want to be a scientist? Uh, no, not really. No. I mean, I like I like school, I like science, I like math and sports. And oh my gosh, well, know. these are all things that I was terrible at in school. Yeah, well, it was fun, but you know, there wasn't. Uh, I didn't have a, you know scientists that I really aspired to be like, or, you know, scientists in my family. It just sort of came when I worked in the lab for the first time. I just really loved it, and that was, that was what hit it home for me. So in terms of cooking, does this mean if you did cook more, you would be a very precise cook? I think so. I think, I think I was talking about this with my wife. I think oh, these, are, these are interchangeable skills that you can either, you know, cook or work in the lab, and maybe people better than me do both. But I've clearly restricted myself to lab work. Okay, so yeah. you can throw in the, the onion. Okay. Next. They're ready to go. Yeah, they're good to go. Okay. They, they, yeah. There's no perfection in this kitchen. It's all very Excellent. unscientific. It's, okay. the, it's the right place for Perfect. me. Perfect. Yeah. There we go. And where did you meet your wife? In graduate school at University of Toronto, actually. And what did she study? She. We were in the same program, molecular genetics, and uh, but she smartened up and went to law school. So now she's a lawyer, and I stuck around for my PhD. Uh huh. <laughs> so. Um, Rice, and then you put the onion on top, and then the next thing that we're going to put on. So this is not in the recipe online, uh, but we had spare vegetables, and I was too lazy to make a salad, so I thought we would just throw all our vegetables oops, in, into the dish. Why not? Um, and did you guys get married up there? We did at the University of Toronto, actually. Yeah, wow. it's perfect. Very nice. My yeah. parents got married there as well, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. They probably got married at Howard House in the big. Open space. Gothic revival building, That's it. right? Uh, yep. 
Uh, they got married at the chapel there, yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay, so next after, so I put in spinach, this isn't in the recipe, you can really, this is such a forgiving dish that you can really throw any veggies in there because you're gonna cook it for an hour. Next up goes the chicky, which I salt and peppered. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks nice. So on the recipe online, it says to saute it um, on either side uh, of the skin, which you can do, but you also don't need to do that. Um, just in terms of saving time. And then a little carrots on top. So I think that'll look nice. And then some tomatoes. Beautiful. Are you allergic to tomatoes? Nothing. Did, I'm good. Should have so asked far. you if you had any if you had any allergies. No, this looks great. Okay, good, yeah. good, good, good. What got you into cooking so much? Is this a passion of yours or so um, my my parents lived in Toronto and they also lived way out uh, out on, on Prince Edward Island. This is spare chicken we're not going to use. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of potatoes in the cooking? A lot of potatoes yeah. and a lot of cattle because uh, my dad was a rancher up there mm -hmm. and he was a geneticist, went mm -hmm. to the University of Toronto. Right. And um, they would have a lot of cattle auctions or actually a lot of auctions for sperm up there. Mm -hmm. And people would fly out for the bull sperm and for these big auctions, which they would have annually. And there wasn't, um, there weren't any markets anywhere nearby. I mean, I grew up having learning how to make butter, and so my mom would cook for the masses. And by the time I was born, she sort of taught me, began to t teach me how to do the same thing. Great. And then uh, I went away to school in Scotland, and the food was awful. So when <laughs> I would come home during the holidays, the one thing I wanted to do was like make good food. Great. So okay, so we're just gonna throw this into the oven like this. This is it. Fantastic. Oh no, no actually, we're we gonna put in the. The chicken broth. Oh, okay. Yeah. This would have yeah, been a little dry. Yeah. We hadn't done that first. And then. Beautiful. Um, mushrooms are later? Uh, no, we can put it in the mushrooms now. Yeah, I forgot about the mushrooms. Throw them on top? Thank you. Yeah, throw them on top. Okay. Perfect. And then, so we put in about, I put in a little bit more broth. I put in two cups of broth. And you can put in about a cup of white wine. We okay. have a little less there. I can throw in some of mine. It'll be fine. Um, and then you just leave it. The, the mushrooms have a ton of water in them, as you know. So mm -hmm. it'll be a pretty nice, juicy lunch for us. Perfect. And then, so I put the oven on at 350 to heat it up. And you leave it in here for about an hour. Great. Um, yeah, there we go. All right, let's go sit down and hear about what you're working on. Fantastic. Do you have your wine? Grab your wine. It's right there. Thank you. Yeah. So Jacqueline is joining us as well. She's going to um, <laughs> throw it. If there's any questions from folks, uh, Jacqueline's going to let us know what they are. Right. This lunch is in collaboration with QBI, which is the Quantitative Biosciences Institute at UCSF, which is a new institute. Um, I feel all of a sudden very short here. Um, it's a new institute at UCSF, and that is where Jacqueline works. Um, so tell us what you do. But tell us in a way, I feel like I should preface this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to close the door because it's a little windy. Um, so, the Living MacTavish audience is not massively scientific, Perfect. and I'm not terribly scientific. Mm -hmm. Despite a, the background. Despite, just, the, despite the background, yeah. I have a pretty sciencey background yeah. coming out of the University of Toronto. Um, both my dad and my granddad went there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sciencey at all, and neither are people who really use Living MacTavish. We know how to bake chicken, but we don't know what CRISPR is. So I know you are using CRISPR or working with CRISPR. Yeah. What are you doing in your lab? We can start before CRISPR even becomes okay, involved. Great. I mean, what, what we work on, I said microbiology before, it's the study of microbes, the study of things that are too small to see. And so these are bacteria, these are single-celled organisms that can cause disease, but for the most part, these are organisms that live everywhere on your body, and in your garden. They're not all bad, right? But most of them are not bad. Okay. Um, but what we, what we study actually is what makes microbes sick? So, you know, viruses and bacteria are sort of lumped into one, one big term of being bad things for most people probably, right. but in, in truth, everything on the planet that lives has a virus that will attack it. Your plants have viruses, the flu is a human virus. You talked about HIV with Judd last time, that's a human virus. Bacteria are no different. They have viruses that will infect them. 
And so the difference, simply put, between bacteria and viruses is that bacteria are alive. They're cells just like our cells. And they viruses are, living. are not alive? Viruses are not really viewed as being alive. They are sort of floating around in the world, and if they find a home, like HIV or the flu, is nothing if it doesn't have a human host. And so viruses really need something. They're parasites. They don't get to do much on their own. They only do something when they find a home. Okay. And so every, every organism on the planet can serve as a home for some kind of virus. So we study the viruses that attack the little single-cell microbes. I see. Yeah. And, and you do work with CRISPR, I think? Well, so this is where... Then what is your background? This is this? where CRISPR was discovered, actually. Okay. So, you know, if you think about... Let's, let's keep the analogy to human viruses. We have an immune system that protects us from viruses. Uh, we have antibodies. We have cells that float around in our body that attack viruses to keep us healthy. Right. Okay, bacteria do the same thing. Bacteria, although they're small, they're single-celled, and they're simple, they have immune systems to protect themselves from viruses. And actually, one of these immune systems is CRISPR. And this is where CRISPR was first so is, discovered. So is CRISPR a tool? I mean, when you read about it, it feels like it's just a really sharp pair of scissors? It's exactly what it is. So, so think if, if you had a programmable set of scissors, and this is okay. the way it's been used as a tool to cut DNA in human cells to make changes and save the world and, and new therapies and all this. But where these scissors evolved and where they originally were discovered were living inside of bacteria. So it's a bacteria. It's bacterium's a, a bacterium's tool. It's it's a bacterium's tool okay. exactly, and it uses that tool as a pair of scissors to cut, not the DNA of humans, but to cut the DNA of viruses that are trying to infect it. And that's really where it exists naturally, and that's where our lab sits. We're really interested in the natural functions of CRISPR, and along the way, people can pull out cool technologies and cool tools. So, so for our audience at mm -hmm. Living Max Havish, mm -hmm. how um, the work that you're doing in the lab, yep. in, in your lab at yep. UCSF, how, how is it going to be useful to me, or how is it going to affect my life? Sure. Well, in, in one respect, you know, bacteria are everywhere. The viruses that infect them are everywhere. This is happening in your body right now. There are viruses infecting the bacteria that live in your body. So fundamentally, that's fascinating to us. We think if we can learn how that happens and what what affects it, that we'll be better off at keeping the good bacteria in our body and removing the bad. So some people are very interested in using these viruses as a drug. I mean, we have viruses that can kill any bacterium on the planet, especially ones that cause cholera or ones that cause botulism or some bad disease. We can use these viruses as drugs. And so I think that's a really interesting angle on, on, on what we do. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to CRISPR, though, what we've discovered are ways that viruses stop CRISPR from working, right? So if you think that the bacteria has a, a pair of scissors that it's going to use to cut the virus when the virus tries to infect it, mm -hmm. the virus actually can throw a wedge into those scissors and stop it from cutting. Ah. As a way, it's almost like a battle. We think of it like an arms race. This is like a huge war. It's a battle. So who's winning right now? Well, right now, it's, we don't really know because, you know, there are bacteria everywhere on this planet and there's viruses everywhere on this planet. Does this make you feel small They're working constant, with these? It, it makes you feel completely irrelevant. Yeah. I mean, we're just vessels for microbes. That's right. really all we are. Um, and you're watching them. And, you have a good view. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of historians, right? We sort of try to figure out how bacteria and viruses have figured each other out, what, what arms they bring to the battle. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is important for CRISPR is that since we've discovered, you know, CRISPR was taken from this natural battle, this natural arms race. Well, the, the, the wedges that these viruses throw into the scissors, we can actually move those into human cells as well and actually stop gene editing. And so we think we've discovered a switch to stop gene editing from working but to allow it to work, you know, part of the way. And so the idea is that this is a safety measure to stop, you know, a bad guy, for example, from using CRISPR to attack us in one, in one respect. And we can stop that. We've, we've discovered the off switch. And does this have any relevance to medicine that we, we would be taking? I think it has big relevance in the sense of if we're going to start to use gene editing as a therapy for anything. And so, you know, certainly nobody thinks that editing babies or something is a good idea, but let's say we wanted to correct disease, genetic disease, and this is what people are talking about doing, using CRISPR to fix genetic diseases in adults. Um, you know, this could have a mistake. This could, you know, this could cut something that we didn't mean to cut. And so what our, what our anti-CRISPRs do, so we call them anti-CRISPRs mm -hmm. because they stop it, we think that we can allow the right change to happen but stop the wrong change from happening. So it's sort of a way to fine tune this incredible, this pair of scissors that have been discovered that are really quite incredible. Just a pair of scissors floating around our cells cutting DNA doesn't sound like such a good idea. Right. 
So if we have a pair of scissors that's finely tuned to fix one thing, GPS, but not exactly, and then stop it from sort of roaming and looking for somewhere else to cut, that's where these these off switches are really handy. But you know, really, really, what we what we love is sort of the virus and bacterial arms race, and we think that be not just CRISPR that we can discover new tools and new kinds of scissors and so on by using these these viruses to help us. Um, antibiotic resistant mm -hmm. illnesses. Yep. Is this relevant to what totally. you're doing? I mean, so so thinking of these viruses as therapies, like I said, that we've got a virus that can kill cholera, we've got a virus that can kill the bacterium that causes diphtheria, we've got any sort of bacterial typhoid. Typhoid is a I bacterium. Had terrible typhoid a few uh, years yeah, ago. yeah, E. coli. Um, anthrax, all of these sort of nasty bacterial infections, every single one of them has a virus that will kill it. So the challenge is we have to find them, we have to understand how they work, and we have to figure out can we utilize them effectively as drugs. And this is something that's been done since the early 1900s, actually. This is not a new idea. These viruses were first discovered way back in the 1900s by a Canadian, actually. And who? Uh, Frederick Twart was one guy. Felix Durrell was a French Canadian who discovered who discovered phages, and he discovered them with cholera patients. So okay. the, the idea of using so these has been along for a long we time. Need a little bit of oh, a science sorry, I meant to say viruses. Phages no, 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 are phages okay. are bacterial viruses. So give us a little bit of a science lesson on that. A yeah. virus is a protein. Viruses are sort of you can think of them as as DNA. Okay. With a protein coat. Okay. You can so DNA simply with put a little bit of armor around it. The armor exactly, so it can float around in the world pretty much uh, unharmed. Okay. It's protected. Inert-ish, until it finds a lot in, of water. Inert is a great way to think of a virus. Okay. Until it really finds its home, it's pretty inert. Okay. Yeah, it's like a rock. And, but is you know, it constantly looking? It's searching in a how passive does it, how sense. How does it find one? Yeah, that's well, a great question. It, how it, does it's it not, find a new home? It, it's luck, really. It's, ah. it's diffusion is sort of the way we think of it, that it just floats. It's amazing that we can't win against luck. It's, it's, it is pretty amazing, yeah. This is really a passive process. They're not modal. They don't have little tails or flagella or something like that. They really just float around. And the ones that are specific to bacteria we call phages or bacteriophages, which literally means bacteria eaters. And when they were discovered way back in the 1900s by this Canadian guy, he didn't know what they were. He didn't know that they were viruses. He just knew they ate bacteria. So he called them do bacteria Do they hang out phages. together, viruses? Do they sort of colonize together or do they work independently? Yeah, they, they pretty much work independently. They don't form a Not united searchable. front. They don't form sort of a little organism of itself. It, they really just float around. And so it is amazing that they ever find their hope. But they, they do, and they have huge consequences when they do, especially if you think of it in our body. If you had an infection with a bacteria where there's millions of that bacteria, if a couple of these viruses got in accidentally or by us delivering mm -hmm. them, they would have a heyday, mm -hmm. right? Because you're essentially introducing a virus that's ready to eat up every single one of those bacteria. And in hours, it can do that. It can just take over. Yeah. And so that's why this is very interesting from a therapeutic angle. Yeah. What's going on? In we have a question. Okay. We have a question from someone named Jeff Johnson. Do you think there are other forms of adaptive immunity that haven't been discovered yet? That's a great question. I think, I think the answer is yes. That's a big part, of, a part about what our lab is doing is we're searching for new mechanisms that might be like CRISPR, but completely new ways that bacteria have invented to protect themselves from these viruses. And that's sort of the basic biology side of what we do, that we're just searching. We're, like I said, we're historians. We're trying to figure out how bacteria have solved this problem. So I certainly think there's going to be other adaptive immune systems in bacteria. Uh, in humans, we call antibodies adaptive immune systems, and that's probably how, how we survive, we get vaccinated and we have antibodies, but every bacterium is so different from the rest. So they've all you know, invented different ways to stay alive. Is there anything going on in the news at the moment that for sort of the average person who doesn't yep. have a science background that they should be aware of that falls into the work that you're doing? Certainly. So you read about viruses or yeah. illnesses breaking out, and none so, of us really exactly understand what it is, but it sounds very scary and we're glad we're not there. Yes. So, you know, when we hear about virus outbreaks in the news, we hear about Ebola right. and West Nile and Zika. You know, th these are viruses that infect humans, right? And so we try to develop drugs to prevent those viruses. From are we keeping infect. up with this? We're, you know, there, for example, just last month, there was a vaccine for Ebola that was incredibly effective that actually was discovered by a group in Canada as well. And so vaccines really are the best measure we have against viruses that infect humans. 
That's why we've been searching for so long for an HIV vaccine and why we get the flu shot every year and why we have shots for measles and mumps and all of these awful viruses and these vaccines are incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about viruses that infect bacteria though, there we're looking for them as, as drugs, right? We're using them to kill bacteria because we want to kill those bacteria. Mm -hmm. And so, although it may not be you know, really in the news, there are a lot of clinical trials going on right now to say, take that case of strep throat or that case of the ear infection or an eye infection mm -hmm. or skin infection. Can we treat those infections with these viruses and can we figure out how to make that as effective as possible? Mm -hmm. Because we already know it's really safe. These, these viruses that kill bacteria don't even touch human cells. Your body is full of them already and they're not doing a thing to hurt you. Uh -huh. All they care about are bacteria. So if we can fine tune that, we have a really powerful drug on our hands. Um, as we're getting smarter about bacteria and yep. viruses, yep. me literally, is that we're sitting here in you in your lab. Mm -hmm. um, are they getting smarter about us? Are they are they keeping up? Certainly. So I mean, are the, they continuing to evolve? To evolve. I guess, yeah. I guess that's the so. Question. I mean, viruses like HIV, for example, are are a pretty modern situation. When we think of evolution, we think of millions and millions of years. But HIV became a human virus 100, 200 years ago. So that's sort of Evolution to humans where, where is staggering. Where was the first? What is the first record of it? Do you it, know? I, it was well. I mean, it was originally a primate virus. There's some like right. contention about when it really made that leap. It was 100 years ago or, or longer. Mm -hmm. But the thought is that it, it arose in Africa and it was a leap from from monkeys to humans right. at some point along the way, probably through ingestion. Yeah. Um, but so in that sense, yes. I mean, these viruses that infect humans are are really um, adaptable. They can switch to a new host, and they're very smart in that sense. Even though they're inert and kind of just floating around in the world, they are really, really uh, clever. And so this sort of arms race is not something that's over. We've just seen it with Zika. Zika was a previously you know, uh, related to a small outbreak in Uganda. That's where it was first identified and named. And now it's become this massive problem. And people have seen that it's because it, it's evolving. It's changed and we have to keep up with it. So it's quite exciting sort of chasing these viruses. It's exactly. very exciting. I mean, you're it's not, sort of, You're definitely not always winning though, right? So we're not. Is, and this is where the, you know, the epidemiologists and the people in movies like at the CDC who track these things, it's really incredible work and it's really cutting edge and it means, you know, has a lot of people's lives in the balance. It's a pretty delicate process. And that's why as scientists, again, we're pretty historical. I mean, we try to figure out what happened. If a virus leaps, you know, if we have a pig flu or a swine, or swine flu or avian flu or all these things, these are changes that have happened naturally. And we try to react and develop a new vaccine, a new drug, and is it perfect? No, but that's really all we can do is react to these changes. And so that's why, you know, for example, you get a flu shot every year, or you're, you're supposed to, because the flu is moving. It's a moving target. It evolves. And so it's updated and every year? It's when updated you're every year. Scientists and, and people who make vaccines make the best educated guess they can to predict what next year is gonna be like. It's not perfect, but that's what we do. We try to you know, predict, but usually we're sort of saying, okay, there's a new outbreak of virus X, what can we do? And that's where people like what Judd's doing and trying to develop cures for HIV and treatments, this is where that sits. We react to what biology has given us. Where can our viewers uh, find out more about the work that you're doing? Do you have a Twitter handle? Do you have All of a it. lab webpage? All of it, yeah. Can you find it on the QBI page? They certainly can. Sure they they can. can find it on the Facebook Live page, <laughs> page too. Twitter at Joe Bondi Denemy, and the lab website is up there, bondydenemylab.ucsf.edu. We have yeah. a flurry of questions. Oh, you have a flurry of questions. Okay. So this question comes from Phil Hager from the University of British Columbia. All right, we're Canadians. Can yeah. work be used to help develop phage therapy? Yeah. Phage to fight off bacterial infections? Certainly. So that's phage therapy is sort of the, the fancy name for what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. That is using bacterial viruses or bacteria phages, the same thing, to treat uh, infectious disease. And that's certainly something that we want to do. And we benefit from the fact that it's very specific. So if you have, you know, we know that antibiotics are a problem because if you take it, it can kill all of the good bacteria. The reason these bacterial viruses are so great is that you can say you've got a, a pathogen in your gut, a bad bacteria, and we want to remove only that one. And these viruses are really specific and able to pluck out the bad guy and leave the and good leave guys. The rest. Yeah. So while antibiotics are sort of a big sledgehammer to the problem, um, um, bacterial viruses are a very, very specific tool to just go get rid of that one. Yeah. Right. Can your findings be used to contribute to the development of genetically modified foods? 
Hmm. <laughs> Is the audience hearing your question, by the way? Yes. Okay, great. So genetically modified food. The, this, this has been happening very recently with, with CRISPR technology. There was just a mushroom that was given approval by the FDA to be put on the market because it wasn't considered a genetically modified organism. All researchers did was they used CRISPR to cut out the gene that causes mushrooms to brown. And so oh, now you have mushrooms okay. that will not brown. We did not use those today. We did not, no, no, no GMO <laughs> crops, well, probably lots of GMO food, which is fantastic. But um, so, so engineering food with traditional breeding or with new genetic engineering like Cas9, CRISPR technology, mm -hmm. is currently happening. Where the, you know, if we can think of that as being the scissors that where we want to cut, if we can think of our work as stopping those scissors, the way that this is helpful is just to keep it specific. So if you want to change gene A, you can change gene A without affecting gene B or C or D. So we can, we think, stop the scissors from going rogue, basically. Okay. Yeah. Very, very specific. Very, yes. Specificity is the name of the game. We don't want to change other genes. And for human, for human therapy, for example, if you want to fix the mutation in one gene, you don't want to randomly cut another gene. That can cause cancer. That can cause a lot of problems. Yeah. Any other question from John Goodart? All right. Why don't humans have a CRISPR system? Why do we use it? Ooh, that's a fantastic question. Great question from John Goodars. Yes. Um, we don't have a CRISPR system, uh, and actually no eukaryotes do. Eukaryotes are every... Where are eukaryotes? Eukaryotes are everything on the planet that has a nucleus, there's a lot of rules for it, but basically every animal, every multicellular organism, even yeast that you use to make bread and wine, these are not bacteria. So the bacteria are on one side, we call them prokaryotes, eukaryotes are on the other. It's everything from yeast to worms to flies to plants to humans. So none of those have a CRISPR system. We have other immune systems. We have other sim systems that are look very similar to CRISPR, but they're not exactly CRISPR. So why it was lost is sort of an intriguing question. The evolutionary landscape of CRISPR isn't so clear, i.e. when it arose and when it got transferred. So I think that sort of would need a detailed answer. But, um, but you're absolutely right. Humans don't have CRISPR, neither does yeast, neither do plants. But they have other ways to protect themselves. Suffice to say, every organism on the planet that exists right now has figured out a way to protect itself from viruses. And they all use different strategies to do it. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Is that it for now? Yeah, I mean, so this, in principle, is the benefit of, of sex. I mean, this is how we're diverse, right? Bacteria divide, and they make a clone of themselves. They don't sexually reproduce. They're the same. So if that virus, if a virus comes along that can kill one, it's going to kill the other. But humans are so diverse, as are all organisms that reproduce sexually. And so the benefit of that is even if a virus came along that could just wipe out huge numbers of humans or mice or whatever the organism is that we're so diverse that we're naturally going to be resistant to it. And then that diversity is what allows us to sort of to, to not go extinct, essentially. Yeah. Great. Well, thank one, you. One to the mobile team, too. Okay. Oh, great. If, uh, is TBI trying to solve underlying causes for autoimmune diseases? Yes. There are a number of groups working on immune conditions. Um, Nevin's, Krogan's lab is certainly uh, looking at this. Alex Marzen is another investigator at QBI who, who does an, an incredible amount of work um, using CRISPR technology to investigate autoimmune diseases um, of many flavors. So yeah, QBI is actively involved in applying these new technologies to study uh, autoimmune disease, cancer, and infectious disease across the board. Great. Um, so we should probably give a little bit of background. Do you want to give a tiny bit of background, Jacqueline, on QBI? QBI is a new lab at UCSF that was founded in 2016 where they're using precision medicine to yeah. cure infectious diseases, psych psychiatric disorders, and cancer, I think, right? And okay. host pathogens. And host pathogen and battles host pathogens. that we've been yeah. discussing today. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, we, we've done this for about half an hour, so we should go check what's, what's in the oven and then uh, tuck into a little bit of lunch. I'm starving Fantastic. myself because I didn't really have any breakfast. Um, let's see what's going on over here. Uh, in a moment. Yeah, let's just have a quick look at what's in the stove. So I did cook one in advance a little bit. So hopefully this is ready for us to eat, and if not. Um, so this is the Angora Lake baked chickie. Um, 
I'm not sure if it's been baked enough. It's going to be steamy, so I'm going to do it this way. Ooh, I'm going to give it a little bit of a... Um, a Ooh, it smells good. That's for sure, doesn't it? Um, there, yum. Okay, this is going to be good. So there's our rice, our chicken, spinach, and mushrooms. Yummy. Well, Beautiful. thank you so much, Joe. This thank you. great. Yeah, fantastic. And, that and looks great. Thanks so much to QBI for collaborating with us and to all of our Facebook friends. Thank you very much, and thanks for our questions. Bye.